This Parsha podcast for Parsha Slech Lecha is dedicated in honor of my dear friend and dedicated listener of the Parsha podcast, Dr. David Jenikov, whose Torah portion for his bar mitzvah was Parsha Slech Lecha. On behalf of the entire Parsha podcast family, we wish him many happy, joyous, healthful, and harmonious returns to Parsha Slech Lecha, and may the Almighty bestow upon him and his family endless blessings. Today is Tuesday, November 1st. We're recording this a little bit early. It's election day in Israel. It's the fifth election without a decisive result quite yet. Now, I'm recording it at 11 a.m. Houston time. So the polls, the exit polls have not been released yet. It's against the law in Israel to release exit polls before the voting ends. So we don't know what things will look like when the votes are tallied. The polls before the election had the parliament, the Knesset, deadlocked again. Sixth elections are certainly on the table. It's certainly plausible. But speaking of democracy, at the Parsha podcast last week, we experimented with a dash of democracy. We made a survey. What do the people want? Let Us ask the audience, one person, one vote, one listener, one vote. Do you want to keep the three weekly episodes that we broadcast on Sunday, 5781 from the fifth season of the Parsha Podcast on Tuesday and the new episode on Thursday? Or is that a bit too much? Two weekly episodes is best. Just do the rebroadcast and the new episode. And by a two to one majority, the Exact numbers are 67.1% voted in favor of keeping the three weekly episodes and a minority of 32.9% voted to have only two weekly episodes. Thank you all of you for voting. Thank you all of you who had emailed me and texted me. And for the many of you who submitted comments, I really appreciate your feedback. It was actually kind of fun to make the survey. It's a little bit exhilarating to get all those responses. Maybe we will do another one. But with that, let's begin. Let's dispense with that democracy and let's restore the autocracy of the Parsha podcast. It's Parsha Slachacha. And we meet the most impactful man of all time. It's Abraham. Abraham's going to change everything. He's going to change, and radically alter the course of history. And this parasha, Netri's parasha, and really the rest of the Torah follows him and his family and his descendants. And it starts with his journey from his familiar abode, from where he grew up, from his father's household, from his land, from his life of relative familiarity and comfort, to the unknown. Leave your land. Leave your homeland. Leave the house of your father and go to the land that I will show you. Abraham leaves the comfy confines of what he's used to and he embarks on an odyssey, an odyssey to the unknown. The Ramban tells us that he actually wasn't told where to go and he meandered from land to land until he arrived in Canaan, and God says, okay, this is it. And when he gets to Canaan, things aren't so easy. There's a famine. He has to go to Egypt. His wife is kidnapped. He has scuffles with his brother-in-law and nephew, Lot. He gets drawn into a world war. He has severe domestic strife when his barren wife, Sarah, She requests that he marry his maidservant, their maidservant, Hagar. And the parsha ends when Abraham is renamed Abraham. He's told originally, initially, Abraham, Avram. And then he's renamed Avraham, Abraham. And he gets the covenant of the brismila, of the circumcision. Now, of course, Abraham's storyline continues next week with more dramatic and nail-biting stories and travails. But I don't want to spoil the story for you. We'll have to hear more about that next week. But the character of our Parsha, the protagonist of our story, 
is a dramatic individual and he's going to emerge and his personality and his choices and his legacy will alter the trajectory of mankind and fundamentally change the world forever. Before Abraham, there was a devolvement. Humanity had devolved into idolatry. They had forgotten about God. They had turned away from God. And everything was in this downward spiral until the arrival of Abraham. And he's going to begin the process of fixing the world, upgrading the world, upgrading humanity, ridding the world of idolatry, building the nation that will effectuate the perfection of the world and the restoration of God to his throne of glory in this world as it is in the upper worlds. But our parsha, and truthfully the next one as well, does not just follow the story of Abraham exclusively. He has a sidekick who accompanies him, his brother-in-law and his nephew, Lot. This parsha and the next one are, are kind of parallel, interlaced stories of Abraham and Lot, or Lot. And when we study and when we contrast these two personalities and their storylines, we discover something incredible. Let's take a closer look. Who was Lot or Lot? It's a little confusing to follow the genealogy, but Abraham is one of three Boys, three brothers. One of the brothers was named Haran. And he died young under very dramatic circumstances. And Haran, before he passed, had three children, Lot, Lot, and two daughters, Milka and Yiska. Yiska, we're told, is a nickname for Sarah, either because she was so beautiful or she was so regal or she was such a prophetess. Yiska is a laudatory name for Sarah. Now, Abraham is going to marry Sarah. So, in effect, if you're following the genealogy, Abraham marries his niece, the daughter of his brother Haran. The son of Haran is, is Lot, is Lot. So, that's Abraham's nephew. It's his brother's son. And it's also his brother-in-law because he is the brother of his wife, Sarah. Now, what do we know about Lot or Lot? So he has, I think, one of the most unusual character arcs in the Torah. He's a he's almost a portrait of paradoxes. So again, his father is Haran, Abraham's younger brother. And Haran died young. He died premature. The verse tells us this is at the very end of Parsha's Noah, last week's Parsha, chapter 11, verse 27. These are the children of Terach. Terach is the father of Abraham. And Nahor and Haran, and Haran is the father of Lot. And Haran died on the face of Terach, his father, in the land of his birthplace, in Ur Kastim. Now Rashi tells us something bonkers. This is the dramatic circumstances of Haran's death. The verse says, Haran died on the face of Terach, his father. What does that mean? So Rashi says, something bonkers. Rashi says that he died due to his father. Because Terach, the father of these three boys, accused Abram, then called Abram, of destroying his idols. We know the story. Terach was a wholesaler of idols. And he leaves Abram in charge. And Abram already has the understanding that there's only one God, and if you make some sort of figurine that's not a representation of God, that has no power, and Abraham slashes and destroys and shatters those idols. Now, Terach was a was an avowed pagan, and he drags Abraham before the king Nimrod to punish him. And Nimrod tries to get Abraham or Abraham to recant, and he says, if you don't capitulate, I'll throw you into the furnace. And Abraham was thrown into the furnace, but miraculously, he was not singed. Now, a lot of people, they were watching this unfold, 
including Abraham's younger brother, Haran. And he's watching this showdown, the standoff of Abraham and Nimrod. And he says, listen, I don't know who to choose. I'll wait and see. I'll do the sensible thing. I'll wait to see which one of these sides win. If Abraham wins, then I'm team Abraham. If Nimrod wins, I'm team Nimrod. Abraham's thrown into the fire. He is not licked by the fire at all. He is not singed by the fire. He's untouched by the fire. So Haran says here, I volunteer as tribute. I'm team Abraham. And they say, okay, well, I'm also a believer. I'm also rejecting, repudiating all idolatry. Count me in team Abraham. They say, okay. They chuck him into the furnace and he is burned. And he dies on the face of Terach, his father. And he died in Ur Kastim. The word Ur means a fire. The fire of Kastim, he died in the fire of this furnace. After Abraham was saved, Haran was burned in the conflagration. And this is Abraham's brother, and weirdly his father-in-law as well. And Haran is the father of Lot and Sarah, i.e. Yistra. Abraham was saved miraculously, his brother Haran was engulfed by the flames. And again, Lot is Haran's son. So we can start off with just a question here to understand what happened over here. You know, why was Abraham or Abraham saved and not Haran? You know, God intervened. Abraham, you're fighting for me. You're willing to go into the fire to not repudiate your faith. I'll intervene. I'll save you. Haran does the same thing, but he is not spared. Now, moving on, if you read those verses carefully, just to understand the backstory here of these people, of these characters, you'll notice that the Torah makes an effort to attribute Lot to his father, Haran, but it goes out of its way to not attribute Sarah to her father, Haran. He has a son and a daughter. There's, of course, another daughter, which is Milka, but the, the, he has a son and a daughter, Lot and Sarah, and the Torah goes out of its way to say that Lot is the descendant of Haran, but it tries to minimize the familial connection that Sarah has with her father. When it talks about the sons of Terach, 11.27, it talks about Haran, the Haran holiness Lot. Haran is the father of Lot. Sarah is not mentioned. When it talks about the wives of Abraham and his other brother, Nachor, this is in verse 29 of chapter 11. It tells us that Abraham married Sarai, which was then called Sarai, before she was renamed to Sarah, Sarah. And Nachor married Milka, which is the other niece, Bas Haran. And then it's the daughter of Haran. Then it says, Avi Milka, Avi Yistra. Haran is the father of Milka and the father of Yistra. Again, who's Yistra? That's Sarah. But her identity is concealed as if to minimize her association with her father, with Haran. You know, Sarah's called Yistra exactly once in the whole Torah. When? When her relation to Haran is mentioned. That nickname, that laudatory nickname is never revisited. It seems that the Torah is pointedly avoiding attributing Sarah to Haran, while Lot is the opposite. There's a studious effort to indeed attribute Lot to Haran. Now, moving on, when we read the story of our Parsha, Lot is Abraham's sidekick. He joins Abraham in his travels. From ur Kastim to Haran, from Haran to Canaan, all over Canaan, Lot joined Abraham. Shechem and Beit El, and between Beit El and I, as Abraham progressively made his way south in Canaan, Lot is with him. When Abraham traveled to Egypt due to the famine, Lot joined. When they headed back to Canaan from Egypt, Lot was with them. And then we have a split. When they left Egypt, just as Abraham benefited financially from his trip to Egypt, Lot benefited as well from being part of Abraham's retinue. And there's this abundance of wealth. And each of these camps 
are laden with so much sheep there's just not sufficient grazing area for Abraham's and Lot's flock. And the shepherds begin to scuffle. And Abraham's shepherds would reprimand Lot's shepherds for sending out their sheep without muzzles. And Abraham says, listen, I don't want there to be a fight between the camps. This is chapter 13, verse 8. Abraham sent to Lot, to Lot. I don't want there to be a a fight, a, a scuffle, a schism between me and you, between my shepherds and your shepherds. After all, we are, we're brothers. Rashi there says something fascinating. We're brothers that Abraham and Lot actually looked the same. They had a similar visage, a similar countenance, which of course we understand to mean that they had similarities. They were doppelgangers. On some level, there was a similarity between Lot and Abraham. They had similar characteristics, similar strengths. The Torah doesn't just tell us, oh, they happen to both, you know, have the same kind of comb over. No, it's telling us that there's something fundamental and and deep about the connection between these two. The Hebrew word for face and the Hebrew word for essence or internal essence is the same. Panim, which means inside and also means face. Why? Because the face really reveals a lot about who a person really is. And Lot, Lot, he looked similar to Abraham. There was something that they shared. There was some sort of overlap, a spiritual overlap between these two. And Abraham says, listen, I don't want to fight. We're we're, we're brothers. We look similar. You're my brother-in-law. You're my nephew. You're my sidekick. We look the same. Let's, Let's not fight. And indeed, these two amicably depart. And Lot makes a terrible choice and chooses to move to Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you look at what our sages tell us, this decision is a really poor decision by Lot. Rashi tells us that he repudiated his teacher, Abraham. He repudiated his faith. The Talmud tells us that on some level, Lot chose to move to Sodom because of their permissiveness in promiscuity. But these two people, these two relatives, these two people that are doppelgangers, they're they're similar to a certain extent, have now diverged. They have separated. And immediately after the separation, verse 14 of chapter 13, and God appeared to Abraham after Lot separated from him, Rashi tells us that those two parts of the of the verse are not coincidentally juxtaposed so long as Lot, the wicked one, was in Abraham's court, God refrained from appearing to Abraham. And once Lot left, God appeared to Abraham and told him, you know, look around in every direction. All this will be yours and your descendants. Now, this is really interesting. Rashi tells us that the presence of Lot around Abraham and Abraham's proximity, that inhibited Abraham from achieving prophecy. Now, we know that Abraham's house, Abraham's court was always full. He was always doing kindness and having people come over very hospitable. And once people would come over, he would use that as a segue to influence them, to get them to repudiate idolatry. We read, of course, next week's parasha. It starts off with the three idolaters. We know, of course, they're angels. But angels masquerading as idolaters, and Abraham does superlative kindness with them. And first he tells them, you got to wash off your feet, Rashi tells us, because they would worship the dust on their feet. Abraham's house was constantly frequented by actual idolaters. Yet that did not inhibit Abraham from having prophecy. Lot, who was righteous, who was almost like Abraham to a certain extent at a certain point in time, he was the one who impeded Abraham's prophecy, which is very interesting. Again, we're, we're going to try to piece this all together in a little bit. 
Now, our parsha, of course, continues to tell us a little bit about Lot after he's separated from Abraham, because there's going to be a world war, and Lot is going to be captured, and Abraham is going to marshal his forces and rescue Lot and win the war with his soldiers, but Lot returns to Sodom. And of course, next week, we're going to hear more about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. Sodom is overturned, Lot is saved together with two of his daughters. And they thought the whole world was completely destroyed. And then on successive nights, they inebriated Lot and they cohabitated with him. And that produced two sons who went on to father two nations, the nations of Ammon and Moab. Once we get to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, we read about how these two nations are not allowed to intermarry amongst our people, even if they convert, even if they become Jewish, they must never intermingle with our people. Why? Because they failed to display kindness when the Jewish people left Egypt. They were not greeted by the nations of Ammon and Moab. And also they hired Bilaam to go curse the Jewish nation. Therefore, they're not allowed to intermarry. The males are not allowed to intermarry, but the women can. And interestingly, the commentaries note that we have in our parsha the departure of Lot from Abraham. The commentaries note that the ban against Ammon and Moab, it's rooted in Lot's departure from Abraham. He left Abraham. He departed from Abraham. He severed ties from Abraham. These two are forever severed. The roots of the schism, of the separation between Abraham's family and legacy and nation and Lot's family and legacy and nation begin here. When Abraham presents Lot with the choice to leave and Lot says, I'm, I'm out of here. You're out of here. You're out of here for good. Now, this would not be so salient, you know, why do these nations really matter, if not for the most famous Moabite, and that is Ruth, the great-grandmother of David, the matriarch of Messiah. She converted, and she, in fact, intermarried, and again, she was a female, so the females are allowed to intermarry, not the males, and she became the great-grandmother of, of David, and of course, Solomon and the whole Davidic line. So there's something about Lot that's going to boomerang back to us. He leaves, he departs in infamy. He ends up in Sodom and he ends up in a very shameful place with his daughters. But there's something about Lot that represents Messiah. Lot's like a, he's like a mixture of Messiah and Sodom, which is a really unusual concoction. But all that is thrown into the confusing cauldron of Lot. And the question that I want to kind of probe is, you know, why, why does the Torah pay so much attention to Lot? What are you supposed to learn from him? What is the grand unified theory of Lot? How does it contrast with Abraham? What do we know about the similarities, but the ultimate divergence of these two relatives? And more broadly, you know, Abraham undergoes such a tremendous transformation in our parsha, and he's such a consequential person, maybe the most, I think, the most consequential person in, in all of human history. And he has his wife, Sarah, that she's also his, his niece, and she's, of course, part of Abraham, but the rest of his family doesn't really join. And the question is, why not? And where did they depart from Abraham? So I want to suggest an approach to explain not only what Abraham did and how Lot, so to speak, fell off the map. You tell me if you like it. If you want to be in touch, you could send me an email. I read and respond to every email that I get. It may take some time. I do have a uh, burgeoning email inbox as we speak. Sometimes, you know, when I'm working on a partial podcast, I have to, I have, let me first do the partial podcast and then I can respond to all the emails. So sometimes I do a flurry of emails right after 
finishing the Parsha podcast. Maybe we'll do that later on today. If you like this, send me an email, rabbitwidget.com. Abraham, Abraham and Lot. There's something similar between these two. Yet there's a fundamental difference. You know, they, they look the same. They were doppelgangers, both physically and spiritually. Lot was Abraham's nephew, his brother-in-law, his disciple. He accompanied Abraham in his journeys. To disregard Lot as some sort of afterthought, some sort of side individual that doesn't really contribute towards what the Torah is trying to convey to us, that would be a gross misreading. There's something very special about Lot. He was he was a giant. Abraham is praised for leaving. Leave your homeland. Leave your father's home. Leave the place where you grew up. And go. Go to the unknown. And he didn't know where he was going. There was no stability in his journey. He followed God with full trust into the unknown. Lot was with him in that. The reliance on God, the faith, the greatness in faith that Abraham displayed when he left and he traveled to Canaan, Lot matched him step for step. We know Abraham excelled in kindness and hospitality. We'll read more about that next week. Lot was also a master class in kindness. When the angels came to visit him to overturn the city, he thought they were humans. Lot treated them with great hospitality and self-sacrifice. Lot also perpetuated the attitude, the commitment of kindness and hospitality to his children. In fact, the Midrash tells us that there was one event that really embodied the corruption and the evil of Sodom. And that is that there was a young girl who wanted to bestow kindness upon the poor. That was against the law in Sodom. And she would sneak out and try to provide a little food for the poor. And she would hide the the, the impoverished, and she would find a way to get around the rules, to skirt the rules, to sneak some food to the poor people. And she was arrested. And she was executed in a very harsh, macabre fashion. Think about it. What, what corruption? A city. There's a, an innocent, pure, innocent young woman who wants to do kindness and hospitality and help the poor. And that's a capital offense in Sodom. And she was executed in a very gruesome, macabre, and heinous fashion. And that daughter, we're told in the Midrash, That's the daughter of Lot. So we see even once Lot, Lot, departs from Abraham, even in the bowels of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot engaged in kindness and hospitality and infused that in his children. When the angels come to the city, quite memorably we read how Lot baked them matzos. Rashi tells us because it was Pesach. How did he know to bake matzah on Pesach? Of course, he got that from Abraham. So certainly on some level, Lot is quite Abrahamic. In fact, we see his his progeny, Ruth, and then David, of course, is Messiah. So ultimately, at least a part of Lot is part of the Abrahamic destiny. But something is lacking Lot goes awry. He diverges from the path. He chooses something else and ultimately ends up being in this shameful place with his daughters producing bastard children. If we study Abraham's storyline, we see tremendous transformation. He's Abraham at the beginning of the parsha. He becomes Avraham, Abraham. He's this individual who is transposed into the patriarch of a great nation. He's a layperson who is transformed 
into someone whose descendants will inherit the land from this commoner into the father of the eternal nation, the nation that will receive the Torah, the nation that will shepherd humanity and the world to perfection. But if we study Abraham's transformation, we will notice that it doesn't just happen with one switch. It's not just the product of one change. There are stations. There are stages in Abraham's transformation. Our Shadows tell us that Abraham was tested with 10 trials and he triumphed in all of them. Abraham's transformation was staggered. It was the product of a series of progressively more challenging tests. You'll notice Abraham at the beginning of the parsha, he's able to leave and to abandon his homeland. But only at the end of the parsha, when he receives the first mitzvah of circumcision, only then is he renamed, is he upgraded from Abraham to Abraham. There are stages. It starts off with a commandment to leave, to abandon your previous identity. Go pursue your new self. Go leave your father's home. Let's go reinvent you. Let's go recreate you. In the land, Abraham is confronted with all sorts of challenges, all sorts of unforeseen tests, 10 trials. Each one is trying to destabilize him, to draw him back to his old familiar self, to the original Abraham. Go back to your comfort. Go back to your father's home. Go back to the ideals and mores and behaviors and values and priorities of your youth. But Abraham stood tall. Abraham clung to his faith. Halfway through his 10 trials at the end of our parsha, he had already achieved a level that he was deserving of a covenant with God. And he's permanently renamed Abraham to reflect this new achievement. But he doesn't stop advancing, always upgrading from stage to stage. In that sweet parsha, his trials continue and his advancement progresses. And it culminates in the tenth of the tests, the binding of Isaac, which guaranteed the nation of Abraham permanent exculpation any time they invoked that event. After the 10th test, God declares, now I know that you truly fear God. Now, it's important to note, the sages tell us that Abraham's advancements did not stop there. He advanced and advanced until the day of his passing. But Abraham's achievements after the binding of Isaac are so superlatively advanced that they are beyond the realm of what we can appreciate. Abraham's advancements post the binding of Isaac was akin to the different gradients of angels. For us, an angel is an angel is an angel. They're all so lofty and so beyond us, we can't really discern the difference. Only someone who is themselves an angel is able to actually sense is able to discern the differences between those lofty stages. You know, chess is very popular now. I was thinking, you know, if you, if you play, you know, if you play the top 10 players in the world, I mean, you don't know which one of them is the best. I think most of us would not be able to tell a difference. Each one of them would thoroughly trounce us. And we would not be able to, to say the, the finest of the difference between the playing at that level is really not discernible to us simpletons. Abraham's advancements after the binding were not revealed to us by the Torah because they are so far beyond us, we won't even be able to perceive those changes. But this is Abraham's trajectory. Test after test, advancement after advancement. Even if we look at his his journey in a very simplistic way, he's always moving. In Haran, where he starts off the parsha, he was very successful. 
we read how he takes with him all the souls that he had made in Haran. Even in Haran, Abraham was a soul maker. He was able to influence multitudes of people. But then he moves. Even if you have moderate success, you are destined for greater things. And you have to constantly be dynamic. Leave the place of your initial success. Go for more and more and more. Never, ever settle. That's Abraham's trajectory. And it really breaks down to two major parts. It starts off with with a decision. A decision to abandon your previous self and to begin this recurring series of growth and transformation. It starts off with a choice. I'm going to leave. Leave my father's home. Leave my birthplace. Leave what I was until today. And now, going forward, I'm a new person. It starts with a decision to change. The Talmud tells us that Abraham was the first convert. A convert in Jewish philosophy is someone who adopts a new identity. It's not just a change in, you know, the religion box that you check. You are a new human. The words of the Talmud, Gerish and his guy, a ger, a convert that converts, kikatan shenola dummy. It's like a baby being born. It's a whole new life. And you have no connection to your previous identity. You've dropped that in favor of a new identity. It's like a, it's like a midlife birth. And Abraham was the first of the converts. He uprooted and severed himself from his previous identity. And that's the beginning of our Parsha. Go, go for yourself. Leave, leave your land, leave your homeland, leave the house of your father. That's it. There's a new person that is going to emerge. Abraham made the choice to abandon his previous persona completely and to adopt a new one. And that's the first stage of Abraham's transformation. If we look at the difference between Abraham, or Abraham as he was known then, and his brother Haran, it was at this juncture Abraham chose to convert, while Haran did not. You know, both of them jumped into the fire to refuse to bow down to the idols. Both of them forfeited their lives for God. But Haran didn't really do it out of conviction. He wasn't convinced. He hadn't changed himself. He was still the old Haran. But he saw, well, if it worked for Abraham, it must work for me. But there was a difference. Abraham had a new identity. Haran was still hedging his bets. He wanted his out. He wanted to maintain his optionality. Haran vacillated. Well, let me wait to pick a winner. He had faith to a certain extent, but it was it was superficial. It hadn't penetrated his bones and transformed him completely into someone else in the way of a convert. Had he created himself into someone new, God would have saved him. God does save all those that have complete faith in him. But of these two brothers, only a Bram qualified. Haran was burned. He did, in fact, go on some sort of journey, but it was an incomplete one. He didn't follow the Abraham protocol of completely casting away his previous identity to confuse the ancient metaphors. He did not cross the Rubicon. He did not burn the boats. He didn't cut ties with his previous self. He didn't convert into someone new. He did adopt the Abrahamic platform, but only on a surface level. It wasn't genuine. In the first stage of Abraham's transformation, he lost Haran. Haran did not live up to Abraham in stage one. When the Torah enumerates Haran's children, it pointedly attributes Lot to Haran while Sarah is masked. She is called Yiska. She is not Haranian, like Lot. But it's interesting, if you look at Lot's storyline, 
he does go proceed with Abraham along his journey to a given point. Lot does make the initial change. When Abraham goes to the unknown, I'm going to leave everything behind and go to the unknown. Lot was with him. We can say that in the first stage, Lot marched with Abraham side by side. Abraham converted. He said goodbye to his previous self. And Lot did the same. And we see that really Lot is very sympathetic to Abraham and Abraham's cause. He studies under Abraham. He mimics Abraham. He baits the matzah. He performs superlative acts of kindness. But ultimately, he is the son and the heir of Haran. He too does not follow the Abrahamic protocol completely. Yes, he advanced further than his father. He initially made that choice, that decision to convert. But that was just the beginning of Abraham's journey. After Abraham made that decision, he was faced with a barrage of tests, with a salvo of tests. And Lot was also faced with a salvo of tests. But unlike Abraham, when Lot faced those tests, he buckled. He capitulated. Abraham was tested. Abraham was tempted to fall back to his previous identity. But Abraham overcame. Abraham triumphed. But Lot capitulated. Initially, Lot matched Abraham. He was willing to go to the unknown. Stage one, he was successful in. But when he was confronted with a test, he yielded and he fell. We're told that Lot looked physically like Abraham. At a certain juncture, Abraham and Lot were similar. They were in lockstep, reinventing themselves together, following God together, baking the matzah, performing otherworldly kindness together. Lot had the potential of being a second Abraham. But his story shows that at a certain point, when things got rough, he remained the son of Haran. When he reached a crossroads, when he was confronted with a harsh test, he reverted back to his old tendencies. Like his father Haran, he was not up to the rigors of matching Abraham. When he was tested, cracks began to appear in the new persona that Lot adopted. He was tested to muzzle his animals, but Lot was seduced by money. His avarice reared its head. When Abraham offered to depart amicably, this is another test to see whether he would stick to his new life or slide back to his old self, he made a blunder. Our sages tell us that his penchant for an illicit way of life was still present within him. When themes got rough, Lot chose Sodom. Abraham represents real fundamental, comprehensive change that withstands the scrutiny and the vicissitudes of test after test. Lot was not quite like his dad. He was able to initially engage in something beyond surface level change. But nevertheless, he failed before the finish line. He tumbled back to his previous self when he was tested. Hence, the Torah pointedly attributes Lot to his father. He too was incapable of matching Abraham. His sister, Sarah, Sarah, she is completely with Abraham, and her familial connection to Haran is deliberately masked. The Torah calls her Yiska. Now, when Lot chooses Sodom, Abraham's prophecy was restored. And Rashi tells us that so long as the wicked one Lot was around Abraham, God did not 
speak to him. And then we ask the question, you know, Abraham's house was always filled with idolaters. That's who he was trying to persuade to adopt monotheism. Yet all those idolaters milling about did not inhibit Abraham's prophecy. Lot did. Lot was a believer who was a paragon of kindness, who was a great man of self-sacrifice. Yet he was the one who impeded Abraham's prophecy, not all those idolaters. And the reason for this is because Lot began his downward spiral. He had ascended to great Abrahamic heights, but because of his failure to stand up to his tests, he began to go in the wrong direction, descending down the path of moral and spiritual degradation. Someone like that. Someone who is on his way down in that environment. It's not conducive to prophecy. If someone's an idolater, but they're on an upward trajectory, they're growing, they're advancing, they're changing for the good with Abraham, and Abraham's moving them along their journey. God can still appear to Abraham when those people are there. After all, they're ascendant, they're growing, they're advancing, and that's what matters. They're heading in the right direction. Lot, on the other hand, he was descending. And someone like that will spoil Abraham's capacity to have prophecy when Lot is in his proximity. But even after Lot departs from Abraham, even in Sodom, he maintains a measure of the Abrahamic ideals. He baits the matzah. He engages in tremendous kindness. Even one of his daughters is killed in a macabre fashion due to his kindness. But Lot's connection to Abraham and this vision of Abraham and this legacy of Abraham ultimately unravels completely. When he finds himself in a cave, drunk and consanguineously fathering bastard boys with his daughters, Lot's connection to Abraham is completely gone. He has regressed to a level totally unrecognizable to his former Abrahamic self. Now, these two sons that he bears with his daughters, they eventually burgeon into nations, the Ammonites and the Moabites. And at the end of the Torah, when the Jewish people are parting from Moshe, he tells them this is Devarim chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. These nations may never intermarry amongst the Jewish people. Why? Because they did not offer you bread and water when you left from Egypt, and they hired Bilam to come and curse you. The kindness of Lot was totally gone from his descendants. Nothing at all remained of Lot's tremendous initial foray into the world of Abraham. By the time these nations had grown, there was nothing left. There was no scintilla, no hint, no remnant, no vestiges of Lot's former Abraham itself. Abraham undergoes a monumental journey in our Parsha, and of course the next one as well. But it's broken up in two stages. It starts off with something akin to a conversion. He says goodbye to his previous self, and he jumps in headfirst into his new life. He has a commitment to wave goodbye to everything that he had been previously, to give it all up and become a new person, to give it all up for God. Haran vacillates. He's unwilling to take the plunge. He doesn't quite make it to the first station. Lot, on the other hand, he does. Like Abraham, he travels to Canaan and is with Abraham, then called Abraham, for the beginning of the journey. But then the parade of tests and trials begin. And that's where these two diverge. Abraham, together with Sarah, they triumph in every test, but Lot 
goes the way of Haran, ultimately losing all that he had achieved, and then some. Now, it's important to note that Lot will bear a descendant that will go the full distance, and that's Ruth. If you study her story, it's its own version of the Abrahamic journey. She, too, walks away, abandons her previous self, her homeland, the father's home, her people, her birthplace. And she literally converts. And she, unlike her progenitor, Lot, she triumphs in her tests. After she makes her big decision, it's not smooth sailing. She is faced with very grave tests. But... She succeeds. She finds some sort of Abrahamic fortitude to overcome those tests and ultimately becomes the matriarch of Messiah. You would imagine that that is perhaps the only thing that was left from Lot's original Abrahamic goodness. It was taken by Ruth. It was fanned a flame by Ruth, and it was brought to completion by this wonderful heroine who goes the full distance of the Abrahamic transformation. I think this study is a very valuable one because it shows us a structure of a journey to total greatness, a journey to total reinvention, It starts off with a choice, a choice, a decision akin to conversion. Take your existing self that has been you hitherto and transform that, convert that to something else. You're a different person. Abandon your previous self. But that's only the beginning of the process. Then the hard work of maintaining that decision, that's when the hard work begins. You will face tests. And those tests are expertly designed to pull you back to your previous self. You will be trying to knock you off balance. You're going to face headwinds and sidewinds and ferocious turbulence. They're going to try to catch you napping. Do you have the fortitude? Do you have the resolve to stay the course? Test after test, advancement after advancement, Abraham showed us the way. That's the idea of the week. That's the eye of the week. Now for the question. Now for the cue. Let's say a little smarter, a little bit more intelligent about the Parsha each week. And of course, Torah will make us more intelligent and more capable and more cognitively gifted in every area of life. It's the only thing that takes the fools and makes them wise. The testimony of God is trustworthy. It makes the fool wise. Listening to Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus, Ludwig von Beethoven, or Bach, and they they play that when the kids are in utero. Oh, it's going to make him such a genius. doesn't work. I'll do my Sudoku and I'll practice my chess, mate in threes. I'll do my Khan Academy to learn my algebra. It's all great, but only marginal improvements. What actually makes us brighter is the Torah. And that's what we're trying to do here, to raise our Parsha IQ and also... Our general intelligence. Let's get to the queue. This question was actually emailed to me two years ago by my friend Shragi. And I had it in my notes for a couple of years. And I think it's a good time to unveil this question. Now, this is a question that I think you should be able to answer. So I'm going to give you just the question, not the answer. Sometimes the queue will have a question and an answer. Sometimes it's a question that is really hard. Sometimes it's a question that's really easy. Sometimes it's a question that you need to relish and savor. Don't even think about the answer. Just enjoy the question. This one, I, I think it's it's an answerable question. It's a good question. It's an obvious question. It's a fun question, but one that 
shouldn't be too hard to come up with an answer. In the beginning of the parasha, Sarah, then called Sarai, is abducted, is kidnapped by Pharaoh. And then things don't work out as Pharaoh had intended, and he showers a bram with gifts. And Abraham, or Abraham, accepts it. He welcomes the notion of receiving gifts from Pharaoh. In fact, Rashi, this is chapter 12, verse 13, on the verse, the verse that says, when Abraham tells Sarai, say that you're my sister, Laman yitav li so that they will do good to me on your account, and I will live because of you. So Rashi asks the question, well, Abram's worried that they're going to kill him. So that's the meaning of the verse, the end of the verse. And I will live because of you. What does it mean that they will bestow goodness upon me? It says Rashi, yit nu li matanos. They will give me gifts. They will benefit me by giving me gifts. So Abraham accepts the gifts that Pharaoh gives him. However, later on in the parsha, after Abraham engages in this world war, and he defeats the four kings, and they want to give him all the booty, all the plunder of the war, Abraham says, I'm not going to take anything, not a thread, not a shoestring. Don't say that you made me rich. Only the Almighty made me rich. So here we see that Abraham is refusing to accept the gifts given to him by the king of Sodom. Somehow, Abram has no compunction with taking the wealth from Pharaoh in the beginning of the parsha. He's not concerned that people can say, well, Pharaoh made him rich. Yet, at the end of the parsha, or towards the middle of the parsha, later on in the parsha, he seems to be very resistant, completely resistant, to not accept any gifts. Why the inconsistency? Why is there an inconsistency a contradiction in Abraham's attitude towards receiving gifts or money from others. From Pharaoh, he gladly accepts. From the spoils of war, he demurs, refusing to take even a shoestring or a thread. Now, for the sake of full transparency here at the Torch Center, our position is to follow Abraham in his behavior with Pharaoh. We gladly accept all gifts. In fact, we actively seek them. The website is torchweb.org. The link in the description. But how do we explain Abraham's inconsistency? How do we explain Abraham's about face? That's the question. I'm not giving you an answer. There are many answers. But devise your own. Come up with your own. I thank you for listening. I appreciate your listenership and your friendship and your kindness and your sweetness. The best, best, wonderful, most wonderful, most incredible audience in the history of all podcasts. Going back to the 1700s. The best audience is you. Thank you so much. My email address is rabbinwagent.com. Have an incredible rest of your day. Fantastic, splendid, terrific, uplifting, invigorating, exciting memorable, peaceful, serene, and sublime. Shabbos upcoming, and please God, with help of the Almighty, please God, please God, please God, we will gather together again next week for the next edition of the Parsha Podcast. Until then, from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, this is Yaakov Walby saying goodbye, and I love you. Send me an email, rebeljim.com.